Just finished doing 19.1. I've watched Travis do it, got to watch Noah, our on-site group, and I've had a lot more observational data to be able to construct my thoughts for you. So in this video, I'm gonna break down intermediate, advanced, pro-level athletes with regards to score profiles and common mistakes they've made in the workouts. I'm gonna teach you how I video review a workout, this workout specifically, and give you an example with Noah's actual workout execution. Then I'm going to explain how to take that video review, or if you haven't done the workout yet, but how to construct a plan based on the most important aspects of approaching a workout. And I think there are three major types of plans people make with regards to an open specific workout. So I'll lay those out and kind of explain how you can approach the workout. Then we'll finish off with five major tips for this workout specifically that I think will optimize your score. Whether you wanna shave seconds off your time, improve your second attempt, or if you're just having second thoughts about doing the open, we got you covered with our second thoughts. If you wanna see our first thoughts, click this video link here, and you can get a breakdown of what our initial impression was when the workout came out. Now, we've actually had a little bit more data. I've actually done the workout. I've watched Travis Mayer do the workout. I watched Noah Olson do the workout. We've had a bunch of people on site do the workout. And that data allows us to upgrade our understanding of how this workout can be executed and some little details and strategy tips that people can use to get better on this specific workout. For the workout, I'm breaking it down as follows. So I'm breaking it into three major groups based on the data that I currently have. Now, as the leaderboard populates, these could change, but these are my current best approximations. So for intermediate athletes, I'm categorizing that for males somewhere between six and eight rounds, and for intermediate females, somewhere between six and seven and a half rounds. For advanced athletes, eight plus rounds for males, seven and a half plus for females, for pros, nine plus rounds for males, eight plus for females. Now, these numbers could change a little bit. They could deviate on different workouts. It doesn't necessarily mean if you got an intermediate score that you're an intermediate athlete, but it's a way to break it down. I also have beginners up here listed as less than six rounds. I'm not gonna spend too much time diving into this group of athletes because I think all of the stuff that I lay out farther in the video is gonna be enough to improve on this. And I also think that beginner athletes, people that have been in the sport you know, for less than two years or just doing classes, doing the open for fun to take part in their environment, probably have bigger picture priorities than just getting better on one specific workout. So I'm gonna put most of my focus on this group. So that being said, if you don't know where you think you're gonna fall, you haven't done a first attempt on the workout, then I'm gonna kinda of explain where I've seen people fall into these different categories. So for intermediates, they're typically people that are competing in RX competitions. So they're trying to go to competitions like Wadapalooza, where they have the elite pro division, then they have an RX or an intermediate category. So people that are pretty seriously competitive, that are putting a lot of time into their athletic development, but maybe not at the next level of development. Advanced athletes can be people that are on teams competitively in those divisions. Some people potentially that are, you know, the old regional level athletes or sanctional level athletes now would fall in this category. And then pros are people that are competing at sanctionals, trying to finish top 20 in the world. Obviously with this workout specifically, it favors a specific style of athlete, so you might have some pros who are shorter and smaller that aren't good at those two movements that are falling outside of that category. But I think this type of a score profile is good enough for you to get a starting point of understanding where your score is gonna be depending upon what your current level of fitness is. The major common mistakes I've seen, I broke down into the different categories. So for intermediate athletes, the biggest thing is I saw major crashes on row paces. So it means they probably went out too hot. I put 300 plus cows. So I've seen people start out at 1400 cows per hour in their first round. Then in the later rounds, they're at 1,000 or below 1,000. So that's a pretty, pretty dramatic fall off. In most elite level endurance sports, you see pretty linear pacing or even some sort of negative split where people can kind of pick up at the end. So if you know, if you have a crash that's that big, you know that you probably over, you thought your capacity was higher than it actually was and 
when you got part way in through the workout, you kind of blew up and didn't have the physiology to be able to put out the output that you thought you would be able to do. I've also seen people hold on to forced unbroken wall ball sets for too long. So that means that people are trying to go unbroken because they saw elite people go unbroken or they think, oh, it's just 19 wall balls. And by forcing those unbroken wall ball sets, that caused other problems. So it caused them to redline, could have potentially caused their row paces to fall off. Or one of the other things that I saw is they know they want to do it unbroken, so they get off the rower, they get to the wall ball, and that transition time to actually pick the ball up is really long because in their head, they're preparing themselves to pick the ball up and do 19 unbroken, as opposed to just getting off, picking it up, maybe doing 10, quick break, and then doing nine. The smaller number is a little bit less daunting for people. So that forcing of unbroken wall ball sets is a big execution error that I've seen for people that are kind of in this intermediate category. Then undisciplined transitions. So the transitions don't really seem like that big of a part of a 15 minute workout, especially if you haven't paid attention to the sport for a long time. However, that little level of detail plays a major, major role in your overall time, which I'll get to when I talk about video review and making sure that you can get better on a second attempt. But the major one I saw for people that are in this intermediate category is their actual row entrance. So there is a skill to, right when you finish your wall ball, get your wall ball into place, get in the rower, feet in, and then start your pulls and accelerate into your working pace as fast as possible. What I see with people here who are a little bit less disciplined is they get into the rower, or they don't get into the rower, they put their feet straddled over the rower, squat down, get both feet into the rower, sometimes even tighten their feet, then grab onto the row handle and start rowing. Now that could potentially be a 10 to 15 second long process and you're doing that on six to eight rounds of work, that ends up being over a minute of total work time that is literally just getting in and out of the rower. So making sure that people are disciplined on their transitions is one of the big tips and strategy that I'll talk about when we get to how do you make an effective plan for yourself in a workout like this. For advanced athletes, obviously as you get farther and farther towards the elite level of performance, you start to see less and less mistakes that people make because they know what details they need to focus on, they practice more, and they're just better at being able to execute according to their original plan. So for the advanced athletes, you still see some fall off on the row paces, I've seen like more 100 to 200 cows per hour as the fall off, as opposed to the, you know, some people were starting at 1200 and dropping down to 700 when they redline. Those fall offs are way, 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 way too hard to come back from. The fall offs here, sometimes it was like they fell off for half of their row pace and then worked it back up. Sometimes they just slowly started deteriorating paces, but there was still some sort of a fall off in overall row pace. Then long breaks in the last rounds. So most of the people that finished in this type of eight plus, seven and a half plus range were able to push their bodies, be really good. Then they get eight to 10 minutes into the workout and you just start to see all of their working paces are still the same. Whatever their strategy was for wall balls is still the same, whether it was one break or whether it was doing them unbroken. But now those transitional rest periods just starting to extend themselves a little bit. So we had athletes here that had coaches or, or uh, their judge was their coach giving them counting cues saying three, two, one, pick it up to try to encourage them not to let those rest breaks get extended for too long. But as people got, got more and more fatigued, coaches were going three, two, one, and then athletes were still just standing there and waiting. So those rest breaks started to get extended way longer than was necessary to be able to perform. Then they didn't really have a final push in the workout. So generally in a workout, as you're getting close to the end, you need to have have some sort of reserve to be able to finish the round you're in and start the wall balls or finish the wall balls, get on the row and start a kick because those final portions of a workout, there's a ton of extra points that you can get. And generally you're at these little tiers of development where people are. So getting five extra cows on the rower could be hundreds and hundreds of places on the leaderboard. And then the last major thing that I saw in advanced athletes is slow row accelerations. So for me, when I executed the workout, I gave myself a cue that said, okay, I want to get up to my working row pace in three pulls. So I get my foot in, get my hands on the rower, pull it once, pull it twice. 
after the third time, I wanna see my number on the screen. Now, it didn't happen every single one of my rounds, but it was part of my process targeting. What I saw from a lot of people that kind of fell in this category is they had faster row paces. They might have set a desire to be at 1,400 cows per hour. They might have gotten up to that, but they rode at 1,000 cows per hour for two cows, then 1,100 for one cow, then 1,200 for one cow, then 1,300 for one cow. Then they got up to 1,400. So they ended up wasting, you know, five to six to seven cows before they actually got to a working pace on that specific row. For professional athletes, the things that change were just the little details. So obviously for a professional athlete, it's different. They're not making dramatic fall offs or they're not really making huge, huge errors and mistakes. It's just the little details. So I'm actually gonna talk about the video review that I did for Noah that would break down some of the small details that held him back from having a more elite score, which should give you some sort of an understanding of how to get better if you are in that tier. But really most of the feedback that I'm gonna be giving is probably best suited for this people in the middle because there's so much extra fluff in the execution of that type of a workout that you can improve by understanding what details to pay attention to. If you haven't done the workout yet, everything I'm about to say is still gonna be important. But step one for all athletes is video review of your initial attempt. And that's super important for every level of athlete because it allows you to get a perspective of what you were actually doing versus what you were experiencing when you were doing the workout. This happens in every major sport at every professional level. Now, even if you're not a professional athlete, taking the 15 minutes to go through and watch your video will yield a ton of results. And I think by watching that and having a more effective plan, getting better at the workout, it makes that 15 minutes worth it more so than going through a longer, more intensive warm up or something that could potentially be a non necessary detail for your execution. You should understand what mistakes you made. So an example that I have for Noah is broken down as follows. Every single round, I did a start time and an end time for the wall ball set. So when he picked up the wall ball, clock starts, so the clock's running in the video. When he drops it and finishes his next one, that's the end. Then transition time. So in this workout, it's from the time the wall ball hits the ground until the first pull on the rower. So not when you get onto the rower and get your hands on it, but when you actually start to pull the handle backwards, that's when that por portion starts for the transition. Then that's obviously the start time and end time is when they finish the row. End time for the row is when they put the handle back, transition time until when they pick the wall ball up. So every round had basically four numbers. So I went through Noah's example and I did every single one of his rounds. He got nine rounds plus three reps. That score puts him in the pro category, but from what I've seen, it's definitely on the low end considering we're trying to finish top 20 in the world. There were definitely points of performance he could get better on. So. What I did was I took his good rounds. So there were, his first six rounds were almost completely uniform, where it's 35 seconds to start and end of the wall balls, which is an unbroken set, four seconds to transition and get the first pull of the rower, 55 seconds. His minimum target pace was 1300, and he was trying to be between 13 and 1400, and that pace started to drop a little bit as he went on. So we just had really a minimum target for him there, and then, four seconds to start the next wall ball round. So this is what a good round looked like. Then there were two notable rounds where he took a towel break because he's in Miami, I guess he got sweaty and thought it was necessary to dry his hands off, which is five seconds. So I highlighted it here. It took nine seconds to do, to do that one little wipe his hands off and then walk over and pick the ball up, which seems like not really that big of a deal, but when you're talking about the small details of a professional athlete, 
these two little things, so the towel break and then just getting onto the rower and not starting the pull right away is a total of 10 seconds. 10 seconds is approximately five wall balls at a working pace. Doing that in two rounds is a total of 10 wall balls. So now you're talking about a score of nine plus three to nine plus 13, just by cleaning up two transitional elements in a workout. So for a professional athlete, that's the level of detail that you have to look at when you're doing video review. When you do your video review, as you start to fall faller, farther back in the advanced into intermediate, you're gonna start to see major discrepancies. So when you do yours, what I would have is figure out what your average time was on all of those. So if you did six rounds, add up your total seconds for all of those and divide it by six, get an average amount of time that it took you to complete that work, do it for all of your transitions and all of your working sets, and then find the ones that really stand out, the ones that are way far off of your average, because those are the things, those are the big points of performance that you're gonna wanna work on to get better because that's where you lost time in the workout. That's where you gave away your points or you gave away your total number of reps. So with Noah's example, this is what it looked like. These are the little details that we're looking at, but for every athlete at every level, it makes sense to break it down in this way. For each week of the Open, I'll do how you would video review that specific workout because it's different based on the workout. But this is how I would do it for this workout, and that's the type of feedback that I'm giving to my athletes. After that, you make a plan. The first thing that I think people need to do when they make a plan is figure out how they want to psychologically and mentally approach a workout. And I think there are three major ways that people approach workouts. The first is a round split time approach. So in the open, you have the opportunity to basically have your own clock, your own judge, a counter there to help you stay on track. So it's an opportune time to just say, okay, I can go into this workout knowing exactly how long my rounds have to be, and I can rest and literally treat this workout as if it were an interval workout, and not necessarily think of, okay, I'm rushing, I gotta go, and it can relieve some of the competitive pressure to allow you to just work. As an example, if you were gonna get 10 rounds on the workout, you know that 90 seconds is how long it takes to do 10, to 90 seconds is how long each round would take to get 10 rounds in the workout. So you could do your work, let's say it takes a minute 22, you can have a counter there that tells you three, two, one, go. So you can try to do your rounds at 122 every time and get eight seconds of rest. This is actually a strategy that we used when Noah was up here last year for 18.1 when his first attempt didn't go that well. We actually took a round split time approach with him. So you could do this same type of approach for yourself to do the workout quickly, build in some rest time, and go on a clock, which can be easier to try to think of each little individual round as its own little workout where you can start to build momentum and build confidence. So that's one way that you can approach making a plan for yourself. If you haven't done the workout yet, obviously you can go up, you can look at where these scores fall, where you think you fall as an athlete relative to these movements that were released, or if you have somebody that you know you're quasi-competitive against and they posted a score already, you can use that to create your round split times. That way you don't have these executions of workouts where you go out super fast, you feel great for five minutes, and then all of a sudden you crash, and the last 10 minutes of the workout just feel like you're getting beat up and run over by a car, because that's not an appropriate way to do a 15-minute workout. Second way to approach it is what I call a race approach. I put be careful here. That's a reminder for me. A race approach is essentially finding somebody that put a score up on their first attempt or that you think that your capabilities are pretty equal to, that you literally go in and you race one another. There is some sort of an energy that comes when you're racing against someone or where you're doing training with another athlete that allows you to push yourself to a higher level. And I think shared suffering is a really good concept that allows people to get better as athletes by having some sort of extra incentive to push themselves because they know the person next to them is going hard as well. So taking a race approach can be a good psychological push. I say be careful here because if you're racing one person, two things can happen that would be very detrimental. The first is that you get way ahead in the workout and then 
because you're way ahead, when it starts to hurt, you're not really incentivized or you have to constantly remind yourself, I'm not just racing this person that's next to me. There's also this huge global leaderboard where every single repetition that I do in the workout counts. And it's hard to remember that if your whole focus is to go in and focus on this one person that's next to you. The opposite is true as well. If you start to really fall off your pace and somebody starts to pull ahead from you, it can be really demoralizing. And then that negative emotional state can start to break you down within the workout and you aren't able to continue to push yourself throughout the whole, whole workout. So I would say that it's not really common to be in type a race approach in the open. The open is a weird format or is a format that's kind of unique that you get to compete, but you get to compete in the comfort and setup of your creating. So if that's the case, I would take advantage of it. Save the race approach mentality for going to actual in-person competitions, or if you're gonna do this race approach thing, that's probably people that are doing Friday night lights and who have a big training environment that they know the people in that environment and can pick the appropriate people to line themselves up against that they know, okay, me and them are probably gonna be a pretty good race in this. You don't wanna get into a race approach with the wrong type of athlete. That could really, really be a, a poor, poor strategy choice for people. Third would be a process target approach. What I mean by process target approach, and this is, the tar this is the approach that I would say almost all of my first attempts with athletes are based off of, is picking specific things that are the major focal points of a workout. You don't wanna overwhelm yourself, and this workout is good because there's not that many elements that you need to focus on. The process targets, as an example, my process targets when I worked on this workout were, I didn't wanna row any of my intervals below 1200 cals per hour. I wanted to do my wall balls unbroken and I wanted my transition from my wall balls to the rower to be quick. So I wanted to get off the wall ball into the rower, three pulls to my working pace quickly. The transition from row to wall ball is a little bit less concerned about and I wanted to give myself that little bit of lax in there just in case I started to get too hot and too overwhelmed. So I created a process target approach that said, okay, these are the things that I need to focus on and I need to keep my focus on these things no matter how uncomfortable I get throughout the course of the workout. So instead of thinking, I want eight rounds, I want nine rounds, I wanna beat Brandy, I wanna beat one of my other athletes, I focused on the things that I thought were necessary from a process standpoint to be able to accomplish my goals. If you have too much of your focus on the actual goal or the outcome of the workout, it makes it very, very, very difficult to be able to perform. So from this, as an example, since I did it, the video review with Noah, Noah's new strategy points of performance with a process-based target approach are to do three things improve the transitions under fatigue. So obviously not wiping his hands off, just letting the ball get sweaty. It's not like a barbell where it could slip out of your hands. So if it gets a little slippery, that's still okay. You should still be able to do a wall ball. Row pace, we increase by his minimum number by 25 cals per hour. So we think that could potentially be about one second per row round. One second per row round could be another nine, 10 seconds, could be another five potential wall balls to be able to accomplish. And then he kicked in his last round of rowing. We just said, hey, start the kick a little sooner. So maybe one interval before he kicked last time, he gets on the row and he starts to push the pace. So these are the process targets that Noah is gonna focus on in his second attempt. For you, if you're creating your first plan or your second plan after having reviewed, I basically have five tips that I think could be really helpful for creating an effective plan that sets you up for success. The first thing is determine whether you're a squatter or a hinger. So most people, I mean the best athletes in the sport are good at repeat pulling and repeat squatting. But a lot of people fall in two to categories. So you might be somebody that is really, really good at repeated deadlifts, but if there's something like repeated thrusters or repeated wall balls, that starts to blow you up. Or conversely, some people are, are really, really good at repeat squatting. So if something comes up like wall balls or something comes up like thrusters, overhead squats, you're loving it. If something comes up like devil, devil's press or um, deadlifting, you might not be as good in that type of, of format or capacity. So 
By determining this, you allow yourself to dictate process targets that make sense for your capacity. So Brandon's one of our coaches and he is adamant and, is, and uh, has coached a ton of people successfully to break all of their wall ball sets and focus on the details of transitions and holding faster row paces because faster row paces are so many more seconds overall than you're gonna get from going unbroken on the wall balls. So for a hinge athlete, they can push the pace on the rower, take advantage of that, and then break the wall balls where they get on, do half the wall ball, so they do 11 or they do 10, drop it, and then do the second set. And that little reprieve, that little drop of tension, not having to do all those squat reps back to back to back, allows people to perform a little bit better. So first thing, determine whether you're a squatter or a hinger and allow that to dictate whether or not you're gonna have planned breaks in your wall ball sets and whether you're planning on pushing the pace on the row or trying to push the pace on the wall balls. For people that are kind of balanced, then maybe ignore this one and think of it as like you have a different limitation or a global limitation versus just one singular type of movement in the workout that's gonna hold you back. Second, accelerate to your working row pace quickly. So you don't need to go crazy. If you're rowing at 1,000 calories per hour, that's okay. But you don't wanna get onto the rower and have this like, half-hearted relax pull, and then another half-hearted relax pull, and by the time you get up to your working pace, you've been on the rower recovering for 20 or 30 seconds. You would be shocked to, under, to realize if you did just get on there, start your pulls, maintain your technique, get up to your working pace, stay disciplined, that once you get to that pace, you can kind of calm yourself, organize your breathing, and start to feel good, even though you think you're at a maximal level of fatigue. So get into your row pace quickly. You can waste so much time if you're not disciplined with regards to getting to your actual working pace. Third, have transition discipline. Transition discipline can, again, it's dependent upon what your score is. So transition discipline for a pro is like get off, and pick the ball up immediately without taking a second to breathe and catch your breath while you're doing wall balls. For somebody that's getting six rounds, that type of urgency is not necessary and it's also probably going to blow you up in the later rounds. So your transition discipline should be relative to the score that you're striving for. So you might say, okay, I have eight seconds of transition time built in every time I go from rower to wall ball, every time I go from wall ball to rower. So if you have that eight seconds, you can get off, have somebody go one, two, three, four, five, six, then when they say seven, you bend down to pick the ball up and then you start your wall ball on eight. Same thing when you're getting on the rower. If you know you have eight seconds, you finish your wall ball. It's easier to sit down than it is to stand up. So get onto the row seat as fast as possible. Get your feet in. Then they're counting. Three, four, five, six. Go to the handle. Seven, eight, start your pulling. Doesn't matter how fast they are, it just matters that whatever you select as the appropriate pace to hold for your transitions, you stay disciplined into the later rounds. As you start to lose that, barter with yourself in as small of a range as possible. So if you can't hold your eight second interval rest periods, then make them nine. Don't make them 10, don't make them 11, just one second at a time. Try to be as disciplined as you can to keep that as tight as possible. Tip number three. Oh, that was tip number three. Tip number four. Be honest with yourself and enjoy the ride. What I mean by that is be honest with where you think you're gonna fall. A lot of people, they'll do a workout, then they'll get smashed on the workout by a ton of people on the leaderboard, and they'll think to themselves, oh, I can do better. They let their pride or they let their ego dictate their next pace. So I got six rounds, but my buddy got nine, so I'm gonna go for nine. That's probably unrealistic. It's probably not something that's gonna help you. It's probably going to demoralize you and break your ego down and make it hard to stay like in the open for five weeks because it's just not an enjoyable experience. The open is a five week long competition and I think you need to figure out ways to keep it enjoyable. One of those is being realistic with where you are, where your training is, where your body is. Push yourself, but also have fun and realize like, 
who knows what the sport's going to evolve into. Like with all of these changes, this could be the potentially last open that we see in this type of format. The open format could change in October. So figure out some sort of a way to be honest with what the open means to you, what it means to your career. Keep the scores in perspective that the leaderboard doesn't really define you as a human being and enjoy it. And then the last is set a minimum row pace. After I said that, it probably would have made sense to flip those, but too late now. So set a minimum row pace that you adhere yourself to in the same level of discipline that you did with the transitions. So if you say, okay, I think I can hold 1200 cows per hour in every single one of those sets, that's great. But if you setting an aggressive pace, which you should, if you're in a competition, you might test your limits now. It makes sense to actually put all your training on the line and give yourself the best opportunity to surprise yourself and do well. So if 1200 feels like you're extending yourself outside of your capabilities, great, you should do that. However, if you know you're extending yourself outside of your capabilities, set a minimum. Say, okay, well, 1200 is my target pace. I want to hold that for all my rounds. However, if I do fall off, I'm going to fall off in 25 cal per hour increments. And no matter what, I'm not going to fall below 1050. And that number stay disciplined on. Allow that number to be conservative enough that you can keep rowing there. And maybe within the workout, you can drop to that minimum thing that you know I can, okay, I can work here, I can recover, I can get myself back to a baseline. Then you can start to push yourself back to your working pace. So if you have that minimum, it's just a little bit of an out within the workout to back off, take a little bit of the pain away, and then get back into the competitive mind state to get yourself back to your rowing pace. So I think that should be a good level of detail with regards to second thoughts based on all the data that I've seen, based on me doing the workout. You should know how to break your workout down if you've already done it. If not, and you're about to hit your first attempt, hopefully setting and making a plan will help you execute to a point where you feel like you did it to the best level of your capabilities and you felt happy. Okay, so those are my second thoughts. A lot of people, especially in this beginner category that I haven't really talked about, are not doing some of the basic things that would be really helpful to get better in a workout. Things like warming up, things like nutritional planning to make sure you're fueled properly before an event, things like creating an initial strategy and plan. So we talked about it a, a little bit in this video. We also have a competitor's manual where we break that stuff down. You can download that. We'll make it clear how to get that, but I'm not sure yet where it's gonna be on the video. Trainingthinktake.com. Then on Sunday, we're gonna post Travis versus Trevor. So Travis on Mayers. On Monday. <laughs> Not Sunday, on Monday. We're gonna post Travis versus Trevor. Travis did his first attempt. He did really well on his first attempt, but we did a video review and there are a little details within the workout that we think we can improve and execute upon. That should be pretty exciting because you never know if the second attempt's gonna be better. We'll put his workout side by side and maybe some additional stuff in that video that could be fun. So see you Monday.